Welcome everyone. I'm, I'm in my office alone, so I'm gonna take off my face covering. So I want to welcome you to my 11th and my last State of the University address. First, to our friends and community members and elected officials who are out there tuning in, thank you. I can't see you, but I know many of you are there, so thank you for your support of this university. And I'm gonna begin this afternoon with a huge thank you to the faculty and staff of UWSP. You have worked so hard over the last many months, particularly this summer, to prepare for the opening of classes this fall. And you've done a marvelous job. It's hard to imagine what it was like asking all the faculty to prepare all their courses to be both online and in person during the summer when they're not even on contract. Wow, that was a heavy lift. And our staff, whether you're over in the residence halls preparing for this fall, there was so much to do over there. And our student health services, if you don't work in student health, and it's really hard for us to know or even imagine what it's been like for them. They've been working night and day preparing for this, and now they are really slammed with all the responsibilities they have for caring for our students and the new testing program that we've put in place that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So Dr. Helen Luce and her staff have been doing an outstanding job for this university and for our students. Also, the men and women over in facility services have been working very hard all summer preparing this campus for this opening. Well done, facility services. And our economic, our, our emergency operations center, headed up by Karina and Neb, is behind the scenes making sure everything works like it's supposed to work. And we have deep gratitude for them as well. So thank you all for tuning in this afternoon and for all you've done to support this university. I'd like to begin today, as we have become accustomed to, with the introduction of our new leadership. First, Patima Gandhi is our new Vice Chancellor for Business Affairs and CFO. She joined us on June the 1st. She began her career at Virginia Tech as an auditor in 1986, then worked for a nonprofit for three years, and in 1993, she moved to Bradley University in Illinois first as their chief accountant, then as assistant comptroller, and then comptroller, and then finally as their chief financial officer and treasurer. She has worked uh, in just about every financial operation that you could imagine at a university. And she brings a skill that is rather unique in, uh, in Wisconsin, unfortunately. Uh, she handled all the bonding for Bradley University. Uh, of course, Wisconsin remains the only major university system that doesn't have bonding authority. But when UW System uh, colleagues found out uh, about this special skill set that Patima has, they were quite excited about that. And I'm sure we'll be calling on her as they continue to push hard, hard for the bonding authority this university system should have and needs. Uh, and her BS in, uh, in accounting came from Indiana University, Purdue University. So please welcome uh, Patima when you have an opportunity to do so. Uh, next, and before I introduce uh, Joshua Hagen, I want to thank Eric Yonke for the past two years as interim dean and for the 30 years he devoted to this university. Eric, I'm, I'm not sure the last two years were the best years to serve as interim dean, but boy, it was sure good to have your steady hand as uh, we work through the challenges of the past two years. So thank you so much for that. Josh Hagen is our new Dean of the College of Letters and Sciences. Before he joined us, he was the Dean of College of, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences at Northern State University since 2016. There, he also served as a strategic action team coordinator, also as interim assistant provost, as their chief research officer, 
and also as a professor and department chair in geography. Before going to Northern, he worked at Marshall University from 2003 to 2016. His PhD and master's in geography are from UW-Madison, and his BA in geography and political science are from the University of Northern Iowa. So please welcome Josh when you have a minute to do so. Next is Lana Poole, Chief Marketing and Enrollment Officer, who joined us on April 1st. She leads the recently reorganized offices of University Communications and Marketing, Admissions and Recruitment, and Financial Aid and Scholarships. Previously, she served as Vice President for Marketing and Strategic Communications at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri for the past four years. And from 2009 to 2015, she served as the Executive Director for Marketing at Columbia College in Columbia, Missouri, where she centralized and established a business-centric marketing operation for the college's 36 campuses, yes, I said 36 campuses across the U.S. and their online program. While at Westminster, Lana led the rebuild of the college's website to drive digital strategies and recruitment something that she's already initiated at UWSP when she's not leading our very significant COVID communication plan. Her uh, MPA is from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and her BS is in communication, organizational communications from Southwestern Missouri State University. So please welcome Lana. Now, before I introduce the new Dean of CNR, I want to thank Christine Thomas for her dedicated past 40 years at this university. Christine, you have made a huge difference here. You helped raise and had a big hand in raising the national standing of the College of Natural Resources to what it is today. And your influence and your leadership will be felt for decades to come. So thank you so much. Brian Sloff is our new Dean of the College of Natural Resources. Following graduate school, Brian completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the prestigious Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education. His career at UWSP began in 2002. Since then, Brian has held a number of faculty and administrative positions, and in 2014, he was appointed as Associate Dean in the College of Natural Resources. He is a skilled administrator and has a thorough understanding of the budgeting process at UWSP. His PhD is in zoology from Southern Illinois University, uh, MS in zoology from Western Illinois University, and his, B, uh, and his BS is from the University of Illinois. So welcome, Brian, in your new position. Next, I want to turn to our shared governance leaders. First, I want to thank Mary and Jason and Morgan and Raven for this past year, and in the case of Mary and Jason, for the past two years. You have been very helpful in your uh, leadership positions, being very visionary, very collaborative, and very uh, hardworking and helping guide this university. And we certainly, certainly appreciate all you've done uh, in those capacities. Moving on to our current leadership, speaking first will be Professor Nerissa Nelson, University College, and is now the new chair of Common Council. And she will be followed by Colin McNamara, a junior this year, and president of the student body and of SGA. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nerissa Nelson. I'm a librarian on campus, and I'm also the incoming chair of Common Council this year, and welcome to the new academic year. Common Council at UWSP is a representative body of academic staff, university staff, and faculty. Our campus has a very strong tradition of shared governance, the success of which depends upon the administration's openness to listening to and consulting with university personnel and the university personnel's willingness to participate in this important work. Service on governance plays a critical role in the management of the university through collaborative decision making, advocating on issues that are important to faculty, staff, and students and also recommending policies that are, affect our work. It is my intention as chair to facilitate and promote Common Council 
and its committees as the institutional pathway for our voices to be considered and heard. We currently have several vacancies right now on Common Council and also on standing committees. We are planning to recruit uh, for volunteers in the upcoming weeks, and I wanted to ask that if anyone is interested in serving on any governance committees to please contact me and we can talk about that a little bit further. For those of you who are continuing in shared governance or are new this year, I thank you very much for dedicating your time to this service. In closing, and I know that you've heard this before, I recognize that the pandemic impacts us all. And I think that this is really an important year to be flexible and also to offer support for every single person. I'm happy to help you navigate any issues that you're having or if there's something that you're having with maybe childcare issues or technical issues, so please contact me. Here's to a productive year in one of the most challenging times that we have faced. And again, I look forward to seeing you and also working with you. Thank you very much. My name is Colin McNamara, and I'm honored to serve as the president of the student body here at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Student government derives its power from Wisconsin State Statute 36.095. And I take that as a very serious opportunity and obligation because we here in Stevens Point have been voted the very best student government for the past four years. And we've done so not just by working with each other, but by working with administration, faculty, staff, legislators, and so many more. Now this year is going to be different than any other, but the student government will continue to advocate for every student, just like any other year. When I campaigned for president in February, there were a few core values that I highlighted, and they are just as meaningful pre-COVID as they are during COVID. Honesty, integrity, empathy, and respect. We're gonna have to adapt to a new kind of normal. And the key to adapting is learning how to walk in another person's shoes and see things from their perspective. Just as students are learning how to live their new normal, faculty and staff are trying to do the same. We need to be patient with not only one another, but also with ourselves. A few weeks ago, I was asked what I was most looking forward to about this fall semester. And I thought that was the most optimistic question someone could ask. Because with everything that's going on in the world, it's so easy to get wrapped up in all the negatives. And I said I was most looking forward to seeing how, the pointer, how pointers will come together to overcome these challenges. And you see, because that's who we are. When we get knocked down, we get back up and we get back to work. And I know that if we work together with honest, clear, and good intentions, we will be able to go back to being one point. Thank you. Thank you, Narissa and Colin. The role of shared governance on our campus will be more important than ever in the months ahead. Thank you and thank all of our shared governance leaders across the university for stepping up and accepting a leadership role. We need you more now than ever before. Last year at the State of the University Address, I talked about eight action items that we needed to complete on, uh, as a campus. Initially, it was my plan to update you today on our progress of completing those action items, but it became obvious that it was gonna take more than an hour to do so. So the good news is that I will send you a written report of these eight items uh, rather than talk about them individually today, because I do believe it is important that we continue to hold ourselves accountable. Besides, I think you'll be impressed with our progress. There is one action item that I do want to mention. Number six, inclusive environment. Here's what I said last year about this topic. We are committed to having an, a, an inclusive environment. It is imperative that everyone on this campus feels welcome, regardless of their identity or background. While I believe we have made progress in this area, there is much more work to be done. Working together, the Division of Student Affairs, the Diversity Council, 
the Faculty and Staff Gender and Sexuality Center, the SGA Inclusivity Committee, and the Center for Inclusive Teaching and Learning are taking the lead in articulating our progress, assessing our current environment, and bringing forward a campus-wide plan to move us forward. I firmly believed this then and even more so today. This was long before we became familiar with the names of George Floyd or Jacob Blake or Daniel Perdue or Bianca Taylor and so many more. We stepped up our efforts in this regard this summer as we were continuously reminded of the social justice inequality that we must overcome in this country. Our work begins at home, right here on our three campuses. Now let's turn to enrollment. There's a story to tell here. For the past five years, we've seen a steady decline in enrollment, over 20%. And we're all keenly aware of the reasons. Demographics in central Wisconsin have not been good, and now that issue is spreading to other regions of our state. The intense competition from the tech colleges and other UWs, and the strong economy, at least up until the pandemic. And in some cases, we simply drop the ball. On class day six of this semester, we were at 7,332, 7,332 students on the main campus, which is up 1.5%. Given the circumstances, this is a huge success, particularly because of our large graduating class last May and our small sophomore and junior classes this year and all the unknowns associated with the pandemic. To be up even a modest amount over a, after a five-year decline in enrollment is phenomenal work by this campus. Unfortunately, Marshfield's total enrollment is down 11%, and Wausau's enrollment is down 4%. The real success story is our incoming class of new students. Now, this is old news in the world of admissions, but I think it is important that we all appreciate the work that has been done over the past 12 months. In the fall of each year, we start tracking the application rates for new students applying for the following fall. Since September 2019, we've had a very strong showing of completed applications for new students. For the other comprehensive universities, the application rate compared to the previous year ranged from a minus 10%, down 10% at River Falls, to uh, up 6% at Platteville. For UW-Stevens Point, we were up 43%. This is an incredible result, especially given the environment of higher education in Wisconsin and across the U.S. Boy, I love this graphic. When you see the spike there and you know it's us, boy, you've got to feel good. By early summer of each year, we change from tracking applications to tracking the number of new students who register. On class day six of this semester, we had an incoming first year class on the main campus of 1577. That's 1,577 students, a 25% increase over last fall. <laughs> you heard me right, a 25% increase in first year students this year over last year. That is amazing. Marshville first year students are down 4%, but Wausau's first year students are up 17%. And your incoming class is always so important because it's the foundation for the next three years or four years uh, of your enrollment. So I am so pleased at, at uh, what we're seeing here. This accounts for, or what accounts for this incredible performance on the main campus? Well, first of all, it's the hard work of our admissions and recruitment staff. 
But there's also a we can help attitude across this campus. Hundreds of you stepped up to help, to, to host students, to do everything that you could do, liaisons in each academic department, and the list goes on and on. Also, the leadership in admissions created a detailed and actionable student recruitment plan. By the way, UW Assistant said it was the most detailed plan they'd ever seen. And we're taking a much more personalized approach to recruitment. Our admissions counselors are reading all applications of admitted students, all 3,000 applications. And then they're calling those students and talking with them about what was on page three of that application. The reaction has typically been, oh my gosh, you actually read my application. We're developing communications aimed at parents as well. And there's been an increased presence on social media. And our new branding and marketing campaign has been very helpful. For example, over the holidays this last year, we were in the movie theaters in Oshkosh and Green Bay, as well as our local markets. But there's more good news. Our admissions and recruitment staff are already focused on fall of 21. Students who applied in August for fall of 21 did not have to pay the application fee. UWSP Foundation paid it for them. This strategy has been very successful in obtaining an increase in our application rate. Our applications in August for fall of 21 were up 35% over last year, which I just described as one of our best years ever. And when applications received this August for fall of 21 are compared to the first month of applications two years ago, we are up an amazing 216%. That's hard to imagine. Well, also opening this fall will be the new UW Stevens Point Welcome Center. It will house the public facing operations of admissions. Imagine exiting I-39 at Stanley Street, driving a mile or so west to Fer uh, Fermont Street. And when you come to the stop sign, you're looking at the new science building in the background and the Burrard Gateway. Turn right and drive less than 200 yards and you arrive at a reserved parking place with your name on it. That will be the first in-person impression our prospective students and their families have of this university. The support of this project by UWSP Foundation has been outstanding. We have raised $825,000. Two of the gifts are at the naming level, but more about that a little later this fall. UWSP has purchased the Newman Center and renovation has started. We are on schedule and in budget. What an amazing story. This renovation is being managed by UWSP Foundation President Peter Crawford. Peter is a retired Kroger executive who was responsible for opening new stores for Kroger. We could not have found a better fit for this project. He is very detailed and is doing an outstanding job. Peter is also involved our interior architecture students in the design of the Welcome Center. Another real world experience our students get at UWSP and something that we'll be sure to share with our prospective students when they visit the center. The new Welcome Center will be another major boost for admissions. Now moving on to the budget, let me begin with the bottom line. Our FY20 state lapse of 5%, which happened last June, equaled $2.1 million. Our FY20 tuition shortfall equaled $4.1 million. Our FY21 state lapse of 7.5% this July equaled $3.3 million, which, is, which may or maybe likely will become a cut to our base budget. We don't know that yet. There has also been a significant decline in reserves and our anticipated deficit on June 30th, 2021 
will be approximately $1 million without additional interventions between now and then. The cost of the pandemic has been significant and can be and will continue to be in the foreseeable future. These costs can be grouped into two categories, additional expense because of COVID-19 and loss of revenue because of COVID-19. Here you see a list of expenses, including personal protection equipment, continuation of student employee salaries uh, last spring semester, and getting our study abroad students home in an emergency situation before the borders closed and airlines canceled flights. By the way, Brad Vandenelsen did an excellent job in getting our students home quickly and safely. The additional expenses from March through August are over $622,000. We estimate the cost to be approximately $1 million for the fall semester. In the next slide, you can see the loss of revenue through fall of 2020, including cancellation of events, athletics, student housing, are all totaling almost $6 million. A number of cost reduction measures are in place. These include a careful review of all positions to be filled, but we're not calling it a hiring freeze because there are some positions that you we have no choice about filling. If the boiler keeper retires, then you have to replace him. We have, of course, put in place intermittent and consecutive day furloughs as well as layoffs, but more about that in a minute. There are now significant travel and purchasing restrictions and an ongoing review of outsourcing opportunities. The restructuring of colleges and academic departments will now provide opportunities to create significant efficiencies in the curriculum. And centralizing certain administrative functions will help reduce administrative burdens on departments. Other measures that are under review include, divisions are currently identifying and planning for the financial impact of the FY21 state budget lapse and the reduction in tuition. Divisions are also planning for the ongoing efforts uh, effects of COVID-19 for FY21 and the possibility or likelihood that the FY21 state lapse will be converted to a base reduction in our budget, as well as the shortfalls in auxiliary enterprises and program revenue operations. This summer, just about everyone on the payroll took furlough days. Over 600 of us did. Collectively, we took over 10,800 furlough days this summer, saving the university just over $1.8 million. This month, we started over with a workforce-wide furlough plan that will include everyone except those making less than $30,000 and a few, very few other exceptions. We anticipate that this will save the university just under $2.3 million through June 30th of 2021. We have also received or will receive additional base funds and one-time dollars from UW system over the course of FY20, FY21, and FY22, totaling over $4.1 million. But only about $1.2 million or 30% are base dollars over which we have discretion. The remaining 70% or $2.9 million are one-time dollars designated for important initiatives at UWSP. Marketing, student recruitment, doctor of physical therapy program, and the social work program on the branch campuses. All aimed at increasing enrollment. And now we come to maybe our favorite topic uh, this, this uh, year. COVID-19. I'm not sure what is left to be said about COVID-19. Since last March, we have shared over 50 messages with our campuses. In addition to several town hall meetings with employees, students, parents, and community members. 
Most everyone on campus is familiar with the steps we have taken to prepare for this fall, so I'll mention only a few worth emphasizing. For example, some campuses in the UW system just eliminated every other seat in their classroom, reducing capacity by 50%. We used a bubble diagram with a radius of 4.5 feet or a diameter of nine feet, if you will, reducing classroom capacity by 70 to 80%, the most conservative standard in the UW system. Also, I'm not aware of any other school in the UW system where the faculty were prepared to offer their classes both in person and online. And we made the decision to require face coverings on campus before, the gov before Governor Evers issued his order and before the Board of Regents established their policy in this regard. I firmly believe that the consistent use of face coverings and social distancing are our best tools in slowing the spread of the virus. I do want to brief you on our testing program that came together rather recently when President Thompson was able to obtain $62 million from the state for testing equipment, supplies, and personnel. We're now testing symptomatic students and their close contacts through our contract with Marshfield Clinic Health System. The maximum turnaround on these tests is 48 hours. This testing is taking place in student health services. We have also uh, established testing, a testing clinic in science for surveillance testing of asymptomatic students in the residence halls. All students in the residence halls will be tested every two weeks as a condition of living in the halls. Our testing clinic is equipped with three analyzers and we are hiring nine staff to run the testing center, which by the way has proven to be quite a challenge. And when running at full capacity, we will be testing 210 students per day, Monday through Friday. We've also established a public dashboard that tracks COVID cases on campus or associated with campus. As of September the 10th, we had 31 student cases and one employee case for the week of September 6th. We have put a notification protocol in place that balances one's right to privacy with transparency. By the way, some of the comprehensive campuses have already had three times the number of cases that we've had. So as we wrap things up today, let's continue to remind each other of the many good things that frequently happen on our campuses. For example, our commitment to equality, diversity, and inclusivity. Our first year student enrollment is up 25%. Why, wow, that is really something to celebrate. And our new Welcome Center will open in November on schedule and on budget. Our certification as a B Campus USA and a Tree Campus USA. And our gift of $500,000 for Pointer Baseball, for, for Pointer Baseball from alumni Jordan and Mandy Zimmerman. Yes, that Zimmerman, the starting pitcher for Detroit Major League Baseball. Improvements include new scoreboard, new branded backstop, and a double batting cage area. With our focus on academics, here are some statistics that I think will put a smile on your face. Of our, our student athletes uh, this spring semester, 12% of our students, student athletes, had a perfect 4.0 GPA, 12%. 27% had a GPA of not less than 3.75. 48%, almost half, were over a 3.5 GPA. And 75% were over a 3.0 GPA, all during a pandemic. Our overall student athletes GPA is 3.28. Our male student athletes average GPA is 3.05. Our female student athletes average GPA is 3.57. Our men's hockey team had the highest men's team GPA of 3.59. And women's cross country won a tight battle for the women's 
uh, the highest women's uh, team GPA of 3.78. All of you had a hand in this in some fashion, helping the students succeed at this level. Thank you all so very much for your efforts in helping our students succeed. Well, to conclude this afternoon, my last State of the University address, I was at a loss of what to say other than a big thank you to this campus for allowing me to serve as chancellor of this university for now more than 10 years. I love this school and I love this community, primarily because of the faculty and the staff and the alumni and the community members and the supporters and the friends of this university. Let me just give you a couple of examples. I have here an email that was sent out from our HR department uh, just a couple of days ago from Eric, our HR director. And he's writing to supervisors, not the entire campus, so most of you haven't seen this. He's writing to supervisors about the closing of our, temporarily closing of our daycare center on campus. And his concern is for the caregivers, our faculty and staff who have responsibilities way beyond their work here at the university, caring for children, caring for parents, care, caring for other members of their family. And I want to share with you just a couple of things that he says in this, in this email. Remember, he's writing to the supervisors. What is important to each of your employees is or should be important to you. Your role is to be empathetic and caring regardless of whether you agree with your employees' preferences or needs. He goes on to say, of course you have to take care of the responsibilities of your unit, but if the work can be performed uh, during non-business hours and it meets the needs of your unit, then do it. Make the situation as flexible as you can for those you work with. He concludes with these words. I believe we will come out of this as better, more compassionate, and more engaged with our work and with each other. We are stronger when we lend our strengths to others and help them bear their responsibilities. We seldom know what's going on in the lives of our colleagues. Sometimes it's tragic, sometimes it's a huge burden for them. But this recognizes those issues and pleads with our supervisors to be compassionate and caring. This university has heart. The The director of the Women's and Gender Studies Consortium across the state had this to say. This is one of the most explicit and clear caregiving statements that we've seen come out across the UW system. I would have to agree. Let me offer just one more example of the heart of this university. This is from our admissions office just a few days ago. And it's talking about a new student coming to us from a Milwaukee high school. She's gonna be a business major. She wants to be involved in the Black Student Union and student government. Scott writes, she made the last minute change from UW-Milwaukee to UWSP because a friend told her about the family-like and caring atmosphere of this campus. Gives me goosebumps just to read it a second time. She's moving here with just the clothes on her back. And so we're asking for donations to help equip her residence hall room. And he goes on to say, we need bed sheets and pillows and comforters and school supplies and towels, a small refrigerator, a microwave. You know, our colleagues over in admissions could have said, you know, 
That's an issue for the dean of students, or maybe financial aid, or even counseling. But they didn't do that. They reached out to about a dozen people that they thought would help. And they did. Within about two hours, these needs were met and more. And they have other students in need, and they're going to share the duplications with those other students. This outreach of our staff to our incoming students reminded me of a story that I'm sure maybe many of you have already heard, but if you'll bear with me, let me, let me repeat it for you. It seems there was a young man jogging along the beach, as he often did in the mornings. And as he jogged along, he noticed starfish had washed up during the evening on the beach. And the further he jog jogged, the, the more plentiful they became. It was just a few to begin with, and then a few dozen, and then many, many more. Hundreds he could see up ahead. And as he slowed his pace to take this all in, is when he noticed. He noticed the old man picking up one starfish at a time and throwing it back in the water. So he had to inquire. He said, sir, you cannot possibly be making a difference. And without a word, the old man picked up one more starfish, threw it back in the water, and then simply said, I made a difference for that one. And that's what this campus does. This campus is making a difference for our students, one student at a time. That's why I love this university, and that's why I love the people associated with it. This pandemic has caused many changes in our lives, not only here, but across our country and around the world. And we're doing things differently these days, and we're not doing some things we really would want to be doing. I know our students were really disappointed when we had to cancel commencement. They didn't have a chance to walk across that stage and to celebrate their accomplishments and for us to celebrate with them all the years it's taken them to get to that point in their lives. And I'll be candid with you. I'm disappointed I won't be able to issue a chancellor's charge to one more graduating class, but that's not to be. But what I can do and what I will do is to leave you with these words. Reach out to those who are alone. Speak up for those who have no voice. And stand up for those who cannot stand. God bless you.